Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated at 39. And yet, within the brief span of time allotted to him, his mark upon the world was made. Shortly after Thanksgiving in 1965, I first met Martin Luther King Jr. in New York. The following day, we flew to his home in Atlanta. And during the flight, we had a chance for some relaxed conversation. It's a good thing that airplanes never had segregation aboard. That's right. They've been integrated all along. Now, that's an interesting phenomenon, too, which I haven't talked about before. The fact that the uh, airplane industry never saw fit to uh, follow through on segregation in the South. Mm. Is it the altitude or the latitude? <laughs> well, from the little of both. However, on the ground, interestingly enough, we did have segregation in the airport and in the terminals, but when once you got on the plane, everything was well integrated. <laughs> and I guess it's because once you get up in the air, you want things to try to go pretty well. Now, at the Atlanta airport in particular, when was the sign of integration first apparent? I think it was around 1960. There was a time before that that the Dobbs House, which uh, was the uh, restaurant at airports, was segregated as well as uh, uh, some other things like restrooms. But uh, around 1960, uh, all of this was changed, and uh, with the building of the new terminal, which I came in about 61, everything was totally integrated. Atlanta has been certainly one of the most reasonable good sense communities in the South, and I think Atlanta has led the way in so many areas, and we feel very good about this. Well, I think it was very thoughtful of you to be born here in that case. <laughs> How did you manage that? Well, I thank my parents for the opportunity. They are native Georgians, and my mother is a native of Atlanta. My father native of Stockbridge, Georgia, which is just about 16 miles from Atlanta. So I grew up right here in this city, went to high school, college here. Of course, uh, now I'm back pastoring as well as heading the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which has its headquarters here. Well, now you're also going to become involved with uh, integrating another facet of uh, community life in Alabama, namely the Braves. Yes, and I think this will be another very good step forward. And we will also have a professional football team here with the Braves coming and football team called Falcons. I think this again will continue to make Atlanta a city that looks forward and moves forward and uh, recognizes that change is upon us. Well, now the Braves coming here from Milwaukee, is that going to give you any difficulty in your rooting for them? Or had you had a favorite team <laughs> other than the Braves? Well, I think now I'll have to root for the Braves because of my devotion to Atlanta. I haven't been a Brave fan in the past. I guess I started out being a Dodger fan, mainly because Jackie Robinson has been a good friend across the years. And as you know, he was the first Negro to uh, enter baseball, professional baseball, in major leagues. And uh, I was deeply moved by the fact that Branch Rickey was willing to be this courageous. And so I've been a Dodger fan, but I'm going to get with the Braves. Later that day, we settled in the living room of the King's home on Sunset Avenue in Atlanta. Incidentally, in terms of the peace demonstration in Washington last week, uh, I noticed that your wife was there, but you were not. Had you intended to go, or was she representing you? She was speaking for herself on the one hand, but on the other hand, she was certainly speaking for me in the sense that I agreed with everything she said, and uh, I agree with uh, the work that she's doing in this area. Well, in connection with that, uh, I came upon this yesterday, uh, which is a copy of her address. Mm -hmm. And I wondered as I read through it uh, whether you had any hand in the writing of it or whether this stemmed from her, essentially. No, I, I didn't have any hand in the writing of it. This stemmed from her, but I, I read it very thoroughly after she wrote it. And as I said, uh, agreed with it absolutely and made certain suggestions. But this is basically her work. And and I share all of her thoughts in this. This leads me to ask you parenthetically, did you educate Mrs. King to uh, become equal to you in terms of <laughs> sharing this burden, or did you research her before your marriage to see that she had the potential for this? Or how did it come about? Well, it may have been on the way. I think at many points she educated me. Uh, when I met her, she was very concerned about all of the things that we are trying to do now. 
no word for Jeff then, and the first discussion we had when we met was the whole question of racial injustice and economic injustice and the question of peace. Uh, and in her college days, she had been actively engaged in uh, movements dealing with these problems. So that uh, I must admit, I wish I could say, and to satisfy my masculine ego, that I led her down this path. But I must say, we went down together because she was as actively involved and concerned when we met as she is now. Now, in terms of Vietnam, which certainly has become the most overriding problem facing the country. It was indicated in many newspaper editorials that you had gotten out of bounds, that you were out of your depth, that you were out of place, that you were out of line. Uh, it's all very well to have humanitarian feelings, but the civil rights movement is your essential identification of the public, and your uh, occupation and profession is, your, is the pulpit. Now, what made you feel that you had a right to deal directly with the heads of government and in a way to circumvent government action here in the United States? Well, let me say first uh, why I got uh, involved in the Vietnam situation and felt that I had to take a stand. And, and I might say that for a good while I remained rather silent on this matter and decided that I would concentrate uh, in the civil rights area and not even and make public statements and any pronouncements on Vietnam uh, for another period, knowing that my wife shares my passion for peace, I decided that I would leave it to her to take the stands and make the meetings on the peace issue and uh, leave me to concentrate on civil rights. But I came to the conclusion that that uh, is that existential moment, so to speak, in your life where you must decide and speak for yourself, that nobody else can speak for you. And uh, you come to the point of facing your own conscience on a matter that you uh, know is so significant and so destined to make it. And this is the conclusion that I came to about Vietnam, that I could no longer be a silent onlooker. Uh, a sort of detached spectator, but that in some real way I had to be an involved uh, and concerned participant. I'm a minister of the gospel, and uh, I take this ministry very seriously. And uh, my ministry, as well as many, a genuine ministry, has not only a priestly function, but a prophetic function. And I think it is forever my responsibility as a clergyman uh, to seek to bring the ethical insights of our Judeo-Christian heritage to bear on the social evils of our day. And I happen to consider war uh, a social evil that has ominous possibilities for the total annihilation of mankind. I'm concerned about living with my conscience and searching for for that which is right and that which is true. And I, I, I cannot live with the idea of, uh, of being just a conformist, following a path that everybody else follows. We tend to determine what is right and wrong by taking a sort of gallop poll of a majority opinion. And I don't think this is the way to get at what is right. Arnold Toynbee talks about the created minority. And I think more and more we must have in our world that created minority that will take a stand for that which conscience tells them is right, even though it brings about criticism and misunderstanding and even abuse. Uh, so that I intend to continue to stand, stand up on this question, because uh, I think I'm right. And I think I'm following the dictates of my conscience on it. As I read about the prophets, the great prophets of the Old Testament and the great prophets through the ages, they have been men who have taken a stand for what they felt was revealed to them by God and what they felt was true. And it brought criticism. Sometimes they were stoned and murdered. Sometimes crucified. But they stood up for what they felt was right. 
I think one of the great tragedies in our is that we are confusing dissent with disloyalty and calling everybody who engages in protest a traitor. And this just isn't true because most uh, of us are motivated by a love for America and the desire to see uh, our country do the right thing in this situation and in all situations. We've got to face the fact that communism is a reality in our world. And this does not mean we accept the philosophy of communism. This does not mean that we go along with what I consider its ethical relativism and its metaphysical materialism and its crippling totalitarianism. But the fact is that uh, communism is here, it's with us, and as somebody has said, it must be uh, peaceful coexistence or no existence. Uh, I would still say that I have uh, great philosophical opposition uh, to communism as a system, but I'm not going to hate communists, and uh, I'm not going to engage in any campaign which will not recognize the fact uh, that communism is a political system that many people in our world will choose to follow. And I believe enough in the freedom of choice and freedom of speech and assembly and all of these things uh, to take a stand against any move that would carry us down a negative uh, path. The other thing that I'd uh, like to point out here, which, uh, uh, which I think is important, uh, there was a time in my intellectual pilgrimage that I was... Uh, I <laughs> that I was... Uh, it's not over, by the way. That's right, exactly. But there was a time when I felt that war was or could be a negative good. I never felt that war could be a positive good, but uh, I felt that war could be a negative good in that it could block uh, the spread of some negative evil force, like a Hitler, for instance, who comes into history and uh, is so misguided and sick that he leads the whole world on a tragic path. But uh, as I continued to think through this thing, I came to pacifism uh, through a very pragmatic uh, point. In other words, to just looking at the practical consequences of war, I came to the conclusion that war could no longer serve as a negative good because of the potential destructiveness and the actual destructiveness of the modern weapons of warfare. I think our concepts today, uh, some of which go back to the early teachings, which is your area again, uh, is that, that one life is all life, or represents all life. I mean, one life destroyed by violence uh, indicates the ultimate totality of all life being destroyed by violence. Well, I think you're exactly right. We've got to have disarmament if we're going to survive. As I've said often, today is no longer a choice between violence and nonviolence. It's either nonviolence or non-existence. And I feel that we've got to recognize that we must live together. That the whole world now it is one, not only geographically, but it has to become one in terms of brotherly concern. And uh, we, are, we are, whether we live in America, whether we live in Asia or Africa, we, we are tied in a, in a single dominant destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. Well, Dr. King, apparently the board which decides who is to receive the Nobel Peace Prize must have felt similarly about your convictions because I'm sure it was on that basis that they made the award. Now, I don't know what the current world population is of Nobel Prize winners. Uh, maybe you could help me. I think it's about 37 now. Well, you're a pretty select group. I think you're about the third Nobel Prize winner uh, I've been privileged to meet. But I must say, I've never met the award. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to explain it to me. It simply uh, states that the Norwegian Parliament selected me for the Nobel Peace Prize, which was presented in December, December the 10th to be exact, in uh, Oslo. Uh, of course, the Peace Prize is in, in Norway, where all of the other prizes are in, uh, presented in Stockholm, Sweden. Yes. 
Now, I noticed at one point in your writings, you had mentioned uh, when you were some years younger that you had felt as though a curtain had descended upon your selfhood. Mm -hmm. An interesting observation about oneself. And I wondered what kind of feeling descended upon you at the moment that you received these awards, the Nobel Peace Prize. Can you recapture it, will you? Well, this was naturally a very high mountaintop experience. Uh, I guess at points I had a, a mixed response. On the one hand, I thought about the fact at this moment uh, that we had conducted a struggle in the United States on a nonviolent scale that had somewhat electrified the world and gained world attention. And of course, when I received the war award, I made it very clear that I didn't consider it a mill in honor to me personally. It was much larger than that. I think it was a, a, a real honor and a tribute to the civil rights movement itself and all of the anonymous individuals who have worked so passionately and unrelentingly for a reign of justice and a rule of love in this country. And I couldn't help but think when I received the award of the thousands of people who started out with me in Montgomery, Alabama, for instance, back in 1955, when we started a bus boycott, I thought of Rosa Parks, who really sparked that boycott. I thought of the, the thousands and thousands of Negro and white students who uh, have worked in, in such a devoted manner to achieve justice in, in our country. And so that this was uh, one aspect of the feeling. On the other hand, I could not help but think at that moment about the fact that I was uh, receiving an award for something that had not yet been achieved uh, in the United States and in the world. Uh, I had to think of the fact that uh, even though I was receiving a peace prize, uh, we were still having tragic bombings in Mississippi and murders in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and other places. And I had to think of the fact that people were still dying in war all over the world. So that it made me uh, more determined to return to the scene of action in the United States and uh, do more to try to solve the problems and also uh, to look at the world situation and try to give whatever uh, I could give, uh, I use uh, whatever influence I have to try to make peace a reality. So I came right back, and I never will forget that about two or three weeks after, two weeks really to be exact, uh, after receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, I was down in Selma, Alabama, where we started a struggle which uh, ended with the writing of a voting rights bill. Now, in terms of Selma, Dr. King, uh, as you say, you've just gotten back shortly thereafter from having received the Nobel Peace Prize. Suddenly, you, were, you thrust yourself right in the midst of this raging controversy. You mentioned some names uh, that stand out in your memory, but I have a list of names here of people who were involved, and I'm sure each one calls forth great imagery to you in terms of your recollection of it. Jimmy Lee Jackson. Now, in a sense, Jimmy Lee Jackson was the catalyst, wasn't he? Yes, I, I would say uh, that that's true. He was the first uh, to be murdered in our campaign in the Black Belt of Alabama because Jimmy Lee Jackson actually lived in Marion, Alabama, which is in Perry County, the adjoining county uh, to Dallas County. And uh, he was the first to be victimized with death and with the terror of mobsters. Uh, well, actually, from the policemen themselves, it's uh, recognized an actual fact that Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot down by one of the state troopers. And uh, when this happened, many people uh, were outraged all over the country and all over the world. And, and I'm convinced that as a result of the sacrifice that he made, Many people in that area became involved who had not been involved. And who wouldn't have become involved. That's yes, right. Course. Was Sheriff Clark directly involved in his shooting? He was in Perry County that night. Now, whether he was right on the scene when Jimmy Jackson was shot, I don't know. The 
and he had gone down to Curry County and the state troopers were there in large numbers. And the sheriff cop was heard making a number of vitriolic statements. And of course, we went several weeks with all of the intimidation and harassment and violence and terror from both law enforcement agencies of Alabama as well as the people who were members of very violent groups like the Klan and the States Rights Party and all of these other groups. Well, Mr. King was aware of this, of course. Yes, she was aware of this whole thing. Uh, and she's been aware of uh, the whole struggle and all of the things that I've been involved in in the struggle. Because wouldn't her fear, if she had any fear about this, be heightened by the fact that you are the leader of the movement? Well, the interesting thing is that she's adjusted to this, and I guess she's adjusted by looking at it philosophically. She's realistic enough to know that emotions are high on this issue and that uh, something can happen. There are many sick people in our society, and people who are corroded with hatred, and they will use violence, and they will assassinate leaders of the movement. Uh, so that my wife is very conscious of this, but it does not stop her in her commitment and going about her daily work. Uh, if one word about these things all the time, they certainly couldn't function. Sure, no. Exactly. So you must go on with the faith that the cause is right, and if something happens in the process, uh, it will serve that cause in a way that we may not be able to see at this time. Now, in terms of your own adjustment to this exposure, after all, you are the leader of a movement. You're the uh, religious leader of your church, of your denomination. You've become known as a world religious leader. But you also are a father and a husband with equal commitments in both those directions. Now, have you become adjusted to this, not as a world religious leader, but as a father and a husband? Well, I can tell you this is very difficult. I guess this is one of the most frustrating aspects of my life. Uh, the great demands that come as a result of my involvement in the civil rights movement and, and the struggle for justice and peace. Uh, I have to be away from home a great deal. I have to be out of town more than I'm in town. And this takes me away from the family so much. And it's just impossible. Uh, to carry out the responsibilities of a father and a husband when you have these uh, kinds of demands. But fortunately, I have a most understanding wife uh, who has given me consolation when I needed it most and who has tried to explain to the children why I have to be absent uh, so much. And I think in some way they understand, uh, even though it's pretty hard. I was coming to that because I wondered what their reaction was when, when their mother would have to explain that daddy was in jail. After all, jail in this country carries a mark of opprobrium for most citizens. Mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, she's done a very good job in getting them to realize the meaning of my jail going. And as she started out talking with them in very simple terms about the problems that we have in our society the needs that uh, many people face, uh, and the fact that the Negro uh, still faces tragic uh, segregation and discrimination. And she always told them that Daddy was going to jail to help the people and to help change these conditions. And it was a very cute story that developed out of this whole thing. We have a, uh, an amusement park here in Atlanta known as Fun Town. And for, uh, first few years after opening, it was closed to uh, Negroes. We passed by Fun Town a great deal going to the airport, and our daughter, the oldest daughter, Yolanda, always said, uh, Daddy, take me to Fun Town. And she would say the same thing to her mother. And we tried to evade the issue by not letting her know that uh, she couldn't go to the airport. But finally, one day, we had to face it. And uh, we explained to her why she couldn't go to Fun Town. She had tears in her eyes when she discovered that she couldn't go because she was colored. But we assured her that we were going to continue to work to get it open. And then uh, shortly after that, I was in jail in Albany, Georgia. And my wife started explaining to her that I was in jail that day. 
And the harvest farms was very wonderful. She had come to the farm that she could laugh about me. She said, well, that's fine, Mommy, and, and tell him to stay in jail until I can go to fun. <laughs> so she learned, and they learned to look at it as a, an experience which takes place in an attempt to solve this big problem. In connection with Selma, Dr. King, I remember you stated at one point that you would rather die in the highways of Alabama than be guilty of butchery of your conscience. Now, what specific thing prompted you to make that statement? Do you remember? That was the moment, uh, the period, rather, when we were getting ready to march from Selma to Montgomery. We faced opposition from uh, the local police force, the local sheriff and the sheriff's office, as well as from the governor of the state of Alabama. They were determined for us not to have this march. Now, I made this statement after the Sunday uh, march, which ended in so much violence, uh, when we decided to go on and march uh, Tuesday, uh, which was two days later. There was uh, still great opposition, and uh, we were getting pressure from many forces, uh, even the federal government, to hold back because the issue was at that time in court. And it was that point, at that point, that I said uh, I would rather die on the highways of Selma than to make a butcher of my conscience. I was saying in substance that we had to march, that uh, conscience had called upon us to march that for the sake of our nation and for the salvation of the state of Alabama, we had to make this kind of creative witness. And no matter what happened, if it meant that some of us were beaten again or arrested, or some of us had to face physical death, uh, we had to do that in order to make this witness clear and in order to stand up for the truth as we saw it. Well, uh, it was at its most strident, actually, during the month of March in connection with the brutality of evidenced in Selma. That's right. Now, I, I would say we faced our most brutal moments uh, in Selma. Never before have we had a campaign with such consistent brutality. Now, it's true that in Birmingham, uh, lives were lost. Uh, the most tragic expression of that was that Sunday when four uh, Negro girls were well, killed in church. church bombing, yes, right. very gruesome. Yeah. Just how? Yeah. But in Selma, we faced more beatings. Uh, this was an everyday activity, so to speak, on the part of the, the law enforcement agents. And then when we finally decided to march to Montgomery, uh, we faced all kind of brutality, trying to get the march off the ground. Uh, it was during that period that Reverend James Reed uh, was clubbed down in Selma and finally died. He was in the march on Tuesday. And that Tuesday night, uh, he was beaten, brutally beaten, and then died two days later. And then, of course, after the march, which was a tremendous success in terms of mobilizing the conscience of the nation after we got to Montgomery, the diehards still wouldn't give up. And uh, there was this incident when Mrs. Viola Lelupso, who had been with us all the way on the march, and who had been working in Selma, helping with the food for the marchers, uh, started taking people back to Selma from Montgomery, and she was uh, shot down, uh, shot in an automobile on Highway 80. Now, the death of Mrs. Lietzow, of course, will undoubtedly prove to be the base for the hoped-for success of your current drive 
in terms of getting proper Negro representation in juries in the South. Yes, I think it will certainly stand out as the symbol in the sense that this is the one case where you had a man tried, the accused murderer tried twice in Lowndes County, and both times uh, he has ended up being acquitted. Uh, so that this does stand out as a symbol of the notorious inequalities that Negroes confront and their allies of the white community as they try to get justice in the courts. So I think this is a step forward, and I think we should uh, be willing to say that, that even though it doesn't represent an end to the double standard of justice in the South, it doesn't represent uh, a panacea, it does mean that a change has taken place and a recognition of the fact that the constant acquittal of murderers of Negroes and white civil rights workers can only hurt these communities and can only aid and abet uh, the violent uh, forces and those who have been part of the change of pathology. So this, it seems to me, is helpful. Now, since we're speaking about the subject of murder and the potential punishment of these individuals, what is your attitude on the whole question of capital punishment as such? Well, I must confess that uh, I have questions about capital punishment, and if I had to just make a brief statement, a, a firm statement about it, I would say I'm basically opposed to capital I would, I would have thought you were. Yes, yes. And for two basic reasons, there are, there are other reasons, but I think if we follow many modern criminologists, they would say that the purpose for jailing or uh, convicting one uh, is not to engage in retribution, but to rehabilitate the criminal. And certainly you can't reform a person by killing them, by allowing them to die in the electric chair. The other reason is that no act of crime is ever committed in isolation. While the individual must take the final responsibility it is my firm conviction that society itself must share some of the responsibility because of the conditions existing in that society which lead individuals to criminal responses. And the third reason is that capital punishment hadn't done what it set out to do. The idea was that if you could make an example, it would restrain crime. And uh, if one notices the statistics on this, it just isn't true. So for all of these reasons, I'm against capital. And you would apply this even to the accused murderers of Mrs. Beats or any other murderer? Oh, yes. I would apply that to any. Now, I do say that we must have real justice, what I would think of as substantive justice, in, in the situation. We don't want a situation where whites are given 10 years or 20 years when they murder Negroes, uh, but when the Negro does the same act, to a white person, he's given up the chair. So I, I think that the one thing that we need in this situation is a sound norm of justice, what Aristotle called distributive justice, giving every man his due. And once this is done, then I'm absolutely opposed to capital punishment. Well, now isn't this part of what I suspect is your attitude of hating the act of the person, but not the person himself? Yes, it grows out of this, but I use it mainly in the struggle that we face today, the racial struggle, so that when I'm in Selma, Alabama, I'm not concerned about a battle with a, a Jim Clark just to be battling with him, because he was taught this way, probably his church taught him that. Uh, his whole culture, the ethos of his culture, gave him the impression that the Negro was inferior, he didn't deserve the right to vote, so that somehow I could maintain an attitude of understanding goodwill toward Jim Clark while hating every evil deed that he did. And uh, I think this is the only way that we can solve most of the problems of the world. But uh, getting back to the actual march itself, Dr. King, certainly a march unique in history, including just the sheer problem of feeding everybody. Yeah. I mean, the amount of energy that must have been spent mm -hmm. in walking, what was it, 54 miles? Just about that, yes. Well, it was a fascinating experience. Interestingly enough, we didn't confront much jeering along the way. Occasionally, you would find some jeering, 
and they were nice enough to try to remind me, and I don't know whether the Klan or what group did this, but they had this big poster along the way where I was supposedly at a communist training school. This has been distributed a good deal over the country, so they at least gave us a picture to look at occasionally as we walked up the highway. But the interesting thing is we found very little cheering and very few people gathered. Now, probably this was because we did have the escorts with us, the army and the troops that had come in. But the other interesting thing was the evenings that we spent on the side of the highway, where we slept in tents, and we were fed there. We would stop along the way for coffee breaks, and we would have lunch along the way, and sandwiches were provided. And you can imagine that this was a tremendous logistics job just to get all of this done, to feed that many people, uh, to provide sleeping at night. Of course, we had sleeping bags. We slept under the tents, and it wasn't too warm either. And we had some rain along the way uh, several times. One day, it rained almost all the way, and yet the marches went right on. I must confess that on one or two occasions, I felt that I almost had to give up because my feet were really aching. And they had started swelling, and several others faced that problem. And I could really understand when we finally got to Montgomery what the lady meant. We used to call her affectionately Sister Polly. And she said, now, My feet is tight, but my soul is rested. When I got to Montgomery, my feet were really tight, but my soul was rested. And we could uh, bear with the inconvenience, the agony, and all of the discomfort knowing that we were participating in a great movement. You had both your feet, but at one point, weren't you joined by this one-legged chap from Detroit who was marching with you on crutches? Yeah, not only at one point. He marched all the way. And this was a, a really a fascinating thing, and uh, something that uh, brought many of us to tears when we would look at him he was obviously tired at times, but he kept going in spite of. He was determined to make the march all the way. And when he got to Montgomery, his hands were not only red, but they were scarred because he had to have it on you know, his hands on the crutches and under his arms, the same thing. So it was a difficult thing, but he was determined to make it, and he made the journey all the way. Now, uh, many Negroes, were surprised and deeply touched by the very menial jobs that were done by the whites who had joined in the march. Yes, and yes. Do you yes. recall seeing any of these? Oh, yes. Uh, many, many jobs from, from cooking back in Selma, because we always sent back to Selma for the food, and it was transported back and forth. Uh, it would come through the line of march from Selma. And many of the people who uh, cooked at the church in Selma were very middle-class white devotees of civil rights who came down to be a part of it. Not only that, uh, as far as cleaning up when we would leave the place we stayed the night before, we would have this big job of getting the tents up and cleaning up the grounds. And this was done by and large by a white clergyman and, and other whites who came down. And then, of course, we had the portable toilets that went right along with us, and the truck was driven by a white fellow who came from San Francisco, who was a theological student at San Francisco Theological Seminary. And many of these jobs were carried out by whites in a very uh, dedicated manner. And uh, the jeering, apparently, was delivered with much greater intensity at those whites than at the Negro marches. Yes. That's exactly right. It's a very interesting thing. I guess this is something of a pattern in the South, and maybe in any social conflict situation. There is a deeper bitterness toward uh, the person that one considers a traitor than toward the one who's fighting for, for his own right, so to speak. And I've seen this so often, that whites in the South have said, we don't mind seeing all over the north negroes fighting for themselves but these traitors and they come to the point of uh, so identifying them 
with the Negro that they say what the lawyer said yesterday when uh, the fellow was convicted in Anniston, Alabama. He called the jury white niggers. <laughs> now, what about all of these orgies that have been reported by various individuals as having taken place during the march? Well, I had a good answer for Sheriff Clark one day when he was talking about this. I said, now, Sheriff, uh, this again demonstrates the irresponsibility of the Alabama police force, both municipal and state. I said, now, you all talk about all these sex orders, and this is obviously immoral, it is unconstitutional, it's illegal, it's wrong. And uh, you mean to tell me you know about sex orders, you've seen them, and you haven't arrested anybody? I demand forthwith that you arrest them. And I haven't heard anything else from Brother Carl on that subject speaking to me. I understand he's still speaking about it, but he hasn't said anything else to me. <laughs> uh, but I might say on that point that that, to me, was the most disciplined months. I was on it. Uh, almost all the way. I had to take a break for a few hours to go to Cleveland for a long-standing commitment. But I was there every night. I was there all the way. And uh, it was the most disciplined activity that I've ever participated in. We went out of the way to see that nothing developed. We know that people are frail and make mistakes. And we went out of the way to see that there would be nothing done that would embarrass the movement. So that we always had two tents. Uh, the women stayed in one, the men stayed in another. And one of the NBC reporters said uh, in a program that he really studied this, he went through the film, and he said he didn't find the one beer can on the march, and he said he was drinking that himself. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you are a clergyman, what is your attitude toward the way people tend to regard religion in its organized sense? The areas in which you think it has fulfilled its mission and where you don't think it's fulfilled it at all. And if you don't think it has fulfilled it, why you don't think it has? Well, I think the chief virtue of uh, religion in our society has been the fact that it has kept alive certain eternal and at points immutable principles great ethical insights that uh, mankind always needs as men move on the journey of life and make the moral pilgrimage, so to speak. Uh, if Christianity has meant anything to the world, its greatest attribute has been that it has at least kept the memory of Jesus of Nazareth alive, and it has uh, kept the ethical precepts of Jesus is expressed so beautifully in the Sermon on the Mount of Life. If Judaism has meant anything, it has given great moral codes and great expressions of man's struggle to know himself and to know God, as expressed in the Ten Commandments and many other things, and finally is expressed in the great ethical insights of the prophets. So I think religion has played a great role in society in providing man with basic guidelines and preserving basic moral tenets that I think are necessary to live life meaningfully and creatively. On the other hand, history is a long and sometimes tragic story of the fact that the purity of an idea is often corrupted when it becomes embedded in an institution. Uh, it's one of maybe the necessary evils of uh, history. You've got to have organization, you've got to have the institution, and yet uh, the minute you get institutionalized, you've got to think about preserving the institution. And then comes a great tragedy of uh, yielding to the expedient course and to the cautious uh, rather than following the courageous. This, I think, has been the unfortunate thing about organized religion, that so often it has become a force to crystallize the patterns of the status quo. Organized religion has, in many instances, become the tail light instead of the headlight. So I, I think this is the, the chief problem, and fortunately, God never leaves himself without a witness, and therefore we need the prophets in every period of history 
to remind the religious institutions of their obligation to deal not only with the ears, but to keep men's visions on the whole. I would like to mention a quotation to you, and I'm sure you know from whence it came. The quote is, men say I am a saint losing myself in politics. The fact is that I'm a politician trying my hardest to be a saint. You remember who said that? Oh, that sounds well, like Gandhi. Well, it, it was written by Gandhi, but uh, in view of the developments of the last number of years, and certainly with respect to your escalation into the Vietnam situation, it could, it seems to me, have been authored by Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> uh, well, I certainly can't claim to be a saint in any sense of the word. I never would be that arrogant, but like all religious leaders and religious people, I have a desire to reach the majestic heights of sainthood. And uh, I feel the necessity at all times, and I guess this is what Gandhi was saying, to bring to bear upon all of the social and political issues of the day the great moral and ethical principles of our world and of the universe. And I think it's necessary for anyone who's working in uh, these areas to have a keen sense of political timing. This was certainly one of the great points of genius within Mahatma Gandhi, that he, he did have this. He was an idealist and a realist at the same time. He combined in his character antitheses from the north. And uh, I think this is necessary, and this is what he's getting at here. And I don't know how much I come to that point myself, but I've been greatly inspired, naturally, by his life and his teaching. But actually, the idea of sainthood is not so much in, inherent in the individual as in the result of his work. Wouldn't you say that? Yes. When one looks at the life of Gandhi, you do see self-sacrifice at its best. You see a man who is willing to give up all of the things that many people would hold dear in a materialistic setting in order to give his total life for the cause. And you see him coming to the point of assassination at the end. Now this, of course, was a sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, but it was inflicted upon him by someone else. While I understand the desperation and the, the deep convictions, really, that uh, lead individuals, whether they are in Vietnam or whether they're in America, to engage in an act of self immolation I must say that I, I don't think personally that this is the, the highest expression of creative sacrifice, for it is my conviction that we must always be willing to give our lives for a cause if death is inflicted upon us as a result of our standing up we must always be willing to do this and certainly that death can become redemptive but the process of taking one's own life uh, to dramatize the situation is something that i have uh, personal problems with but at the same time i i feel the need of understanding the situation, the conditions, uh, the real problems in our world that lead people to the point of feeling that they must go to this ultimate uh, ominous point in order to dramatize their objection and their opposition to the continuation of war. Well, now, you have certainly, by your acts, knowingly and consciously, this has been one of the problems that your wife has faced, uh, just being married to you. You've exposed yourself to the constant danger of assassination for doing and expressing the things that you believe in. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the situations that developed is a very difficult thing for anyone to be objective about, and you mentioned just now that you had personal problems about the subject of self-immolation. If you could see any advantage accruing to the civil rights movement by virtue of your death, what would your attitude be toward it? Well, it depends on uh, the form of the death, as, as I said, uh, I have problems about the whole question of taking one's own life. Well, possibly, right. too, I think yes. you probably feel that, as I do, that it's, in a sense, it's the height of violence. Yes, uh, of taking one's own life. Yes. However, to willingly give your life 
And, and I'm sure that there have been uh, individuals in history who realized that they were giving their lives for what they considered truth and what they considered the highest and best. Socrates, for example. Jesus is another very powerful example of individuals who realized that they were going to face crucifixion or drink the hemlock, but they did it because they could not be untrue to that which conscience told them was right. And I think if I had to face such a decision, uh, I would do the same thing. I wouldn't take my own life, but I would willingly give my life for that which I think is right. And I am convinced that when one does this honestly, that death can have a redemptive value because I feel that unmerited suffering is redemptive.